Hello and uh, welcome to the fourth episode of Richmond Desert Island Discs. Our castaway for today is Gabriel Stein. Thank you for coming along today, Gabriel. And uh, how are you? It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so, Gabriel, you, I mean, you've been a member of Richmond for around 15 years, uh, but of course it didn't, your life didn't start in Richmond at all. Um, very much you grew up in Sweden. So could you just tell us a little bit uh, what life was like growing up in Sweden all those years ago? It was very good. Um, so I was born in 1956, and this was a time when Sweden was uh, one of the richest countries in the world. Um, it had helped that Sweden didn't take part in World War II. Um, my parents were middle class, um, none of them born in Sweden. Um, we had a very good life. Um, I enjoyed go I enjoyed my school. I had lots of friends. Uh, I have two siblings, an elder brother and a younger sister. Um, it was a very, very normal life in many ways, for better and worse. How did your parents get to Sweden in the first place? And now that's already more interesting. Um, so my mother was born in Poland and survived the war in ghetto in Poland. And uh, uh, she was very lucky. She survived together with her nuclear family, her brother, her parents, and her maternal grandmother. After the war, um, my grandfather, who was a prominent physician, wanted to stay in Poland, but his wife and my uncle both said, we're not staying here. There's too much anti-Semitism. Um, they wanted to go to the United States where we had family. Um, the American quota was ostensibly full. Of course, we now know that the Americans lied about that throughout the war years and after. But they got transit visas to Paraguay. And with transit visas to Paraguay, they could come to Sweden. They came to Sweden. And after a few years, when it became obvious that they were not going to be able to go to the United States, they wanted to stay in Sweden. So that's one side. The second side, my father was born in Germany, but from Polish parents. He was in the French army during the war. He, 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 had, uh, he grew up in Germany, France, and Britain. Um, when all of France was occupied, he went, fled to Switzerland and was interned there, then came back to France. And after the war, he worked for L'Oréal, and he came to Sweden on business. And he had a cousin in Sweden. He was the son of the youngest of eight children. And his cousin was the daughter of the eldest of those eight children. So, of course, he went to visit the cousin and met her young daughter and fell in love with her. So my father and my maternal grandmother are first cousins. Um, and that's how they, uh, how my parents met. And my father decided to stay in Sweden. Uh, and so my mother came in 46, my father came in 48. And you were mainly around the Stockholm area. What was Jewish life like in Stockholm and the Jewish life for you personally as well, amongst your family, but also, of course, the general Stockholm community? Okay, so... This is slightly more complicated um, because um, although we always knew that we were Jewish, we were very, very assimilated. And I think the family was very assimilated before the war as well. In Poland, I would say as much as the Poles would let them and uh, more so in Western Europe. Um, so, as I said, we knew we were Jewish. We would go to my grandparents to celebrate uh, Pesach and Rosh Hashanah. But those were the only two Jewish holidays that I actually knew about. I didn't know about any other Jewish holidays. I found out about Yom Kippur when the uh, Syrians and Egyptians attacked in 1973. Um, I didn't have 
any Jewish friends, uh, unless there were people that I would meet at my grandparents for uh, some party or so. Um, so from my perspective, growing up Jewish was simply, yeah, I'm Jewish. So what? The, the Jewish awakening came in the 1970s. Um, now, Jewish life in Sweden, Jews have always been a very small minority in Sweden. Um, they were not allowed in the country until the 1780s. They got, uh, well, Sweden emancipated Jews and Catholics in the 19th century, but full religious freedom, including the freedom to not profess any faith at all, only came in the 1950s. Um, so I think the sweet and, and, and also I should say a lot of the Swedish Jewish community as they came, the next generations would assimilate and eventually marry out. It was very attractive for the Swedish upper middle class to marry Jews because the Swedes felt that, that the Swedes had money, but the Jews had the culture. Um, which means that there are very few Jewish families who have remained Jewish throughout. So until World War II, it was a very small community, two or 3,000. After the war, went up to maybe 15,000. But it was all, most Swedes have never met a Jew. They don't know anything about Jews. Or what they know is... is um, I don't want to say prejudiced, but, but stereotyped. So even today, um, Swedes probably think Jews are a bit strange. Um, is there anti-Semitism? Of course, there is some anti-Semitism. There's a lot of anti-Semitism that has come with immigration, notably from the Middle East. Uh, but, but at the time when I grew up, I think it was more like, yes, there are some Jews, they are a bit peculiar, there's nothing to it, really. I consciously encountered anti-Semitism once and once only during my, uh, um, well, broadly speaking, throughout my time in Sweden. Yeah. The first song you've chosen is a version of what was apparently an old Swedish drinking song. Uh, could you perhaps explain a bit of background to this song and why you've chosen it today? I'm not going to attempt to try and pronounce it. You can help us out with that. It's called Solum Gavi Susmoningom, which translates as uh, ultimately, ultimately we will all shuffle, and it means shuffle off, as in die. It's a drinking song. It's uh, written by Sweden's great 18th century poet Carl Michael Bellman. Uh, but I chose it not so much because it is a drinking song, but because the message of the song is really um, the same uh, as in uh, Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, chavel uh, chavalim, we're all going to die. Everyone will die. Youth, uh, make sure you have a good time, enjoy the maidens, you learned man, you priest, you, 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 uh, uh, you know, whatever your station is in life, you will all die. And if you don't like the thought, have a drink, then have another and a second one and a third one, and then you'll die much happier. And that's all it's about. Okay, we're going to play that now. Vi så småningom Från back i buller och tumult När döden ropar Granne kom Ditt timglas är nu fullt Du gubbe fäll din krycka ner Och du du yngling Lyd min lag Den skönsta nymf som åt dig ler I under armen tag Tycker du att graven är för djup Och vid land så ta dig då En sug ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och Så dör du nöjdare Du vid din rem 
marré och press Röd brusig och med hatt på sne Snart skrider du fram din likprocess I några svarta led Och du som pratar där så stort Med band och stjärnor på din rock Och en snickan tisdagen färdig gjort Och hyvlar på det slott Tycker du att graven är för djup novelan Så ta dig då en sup Ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre Så dör du nöjdare Och du som under titlars klang Din tiggarstav för djupt vart år Som knappast har med all din rang En skilling till din bål Och du som ilsken feg och lat Fördömer vaggan som dig välft Och ändå dagligt är plakat till glasets sista hälv Tycker du att graven är för djup novellan Så ta dig då en sup Ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre Så dör du nöjdare Du som vid Markis fält basun I blodig skjorta sträcktig steg Och du som tumlar i pollun I kloris armar feg Och du som med din gyllne bok Vid templets genljud reser dig Som rister huvud, läd och klok Och för mot avgrundkrig Tycker du att graven är för djup på det land Så ta dig då en sup Ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre Så dör du nöjda herre Men du som med en ärlig min Plär dina vänner häda jämt Och dem förtalar vid ditt vin Och det liksom på skämt och du som ej försvarar dem Fast än ur deras flaskor du Du väl kan slicka dina fem Vad svarar du väl nu? Tycker du att graven är för djup novellan Så ta dig då en sur Ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre Så dör du nöjdare men du som till din återfärd Ifrån det du till bordet gick Ej klingat för din raska värld Fast än han ropar och drick Driv sådan gäst från mat och vin Kör honom med sitt anhang ut Och sen med en ovänlig min Ryck rämman i hans trut Tycker du att graden är för djup novellan Så ta dig då en sup Ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre Så dör du nöjdare Säg är du nöjd min granne Säg så prisa världen nu till slut Om vi har en och samma väg Så följ oss och drick ut Men först med vinet rött och vitt För vår värdina bud om oss och han kom sen i graven fritt vid aftonstjärnans blås tycker du att graven är för djup novellan så ta dig då en sult ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre så dör du nöjdare tycker du att graven är för djup novellan så ta dig då en sult ta dig sen dit och en dit och två dit och tre så dör du nöjdare So you've spent um, over 40 years in the field of economics. Uh, what led you to that particular career? Um, I've always been interested in history and I knew I was going to become an archaeologist. Then I didn't become an archaeologist, but after I finished studying, uh, after I graduated from secondary school, I did study modern history for a year at Stockholm University. And I was strongly tempted to go on and do a PhD. And I spoke with my teacher. Now, this was a time when um, Sweden was in the grip of the post-1968 left wing. And universities were open for anyone. You didn't need any qualifier to go to most types of university education. If you felt you could do it, then you could go. Uh, and my teacher said, you know what? You love history and you're not going to love being an historian because there are far too many studying history in Stockholm alone. We get 70 new PhDs every year and there are nine positions and they're already filled, uh, keep it as a hobby. So I took his advice. My brother had studied economics at the School of Economics in Stockholm. 
And that was, I knew very little about economics, but I knew it was important for politics and I was interested in politics as well. So uh, my grades were not good enough to start at the School of Economics. That was one of the few schools where you needed to qualify to get in, but I worked for a year I got in and I enjoyed that very much. I found it was fascinating. Um, and yet history remained my hobby. What element of your career would you say you enjoyed the most? I worked for 20 years for a company here in London um, as an economics forecaster. And that involved a lot of uh, interacting with clients, uh, attempting to forecast the world economy and then going to tell clients these are our views and this is why we have these views. I really enjoyed that. Um, our salespeople were kind enough to say that I was good at it. Um, I hope they were right. But in some ways, perhaps the best meeting I ever had during those 20 years was when I went to one client and said, and, and he was Jewish, by the way, and I said, Josh, you've been a client for 20 years, you know, everything we think, what do you want me to talk to you about? And he said, oh, it's very simple. You will now tell me where you might be wrong. So I had to think on my feet and spend the next hour attacking our position. That was good fun. But, but in general, I really enjoyed meeting clients, doing conferences and so on. And of course, the work behind it, the intellectual challenge. You have to come up with something new all the time. You did a short stint in Israel as well. So what influenced that decision and what was that like? In the early 1970s, I saw an exhibit at the uh, National History Museum in Stockholm of the uh, Masada excavation. And all at that stage, I had already been interested in history for 10 years. I had never really read up on Jewish history. So this entire part, the, the, the second Commonwealth was completely new to me. And I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and uh, when I finished my studies, during my last year at university, I joined uh, the Stockholm JSOC. Uh, and I realized I've never been to Israel. Uh, I've been to a lot of countries. I should go to Israel as well. And the Shaliach of the Zionist organization told me about the Wujis program in Arad, where you went to an old palm. And I decided to apply for that. And I got in. And the, the attraction of that program was that it, you had to have a degree and half of the year you went, you were in Israel, you worked in your field. So I went there, I learned Hebrew. Uh, I think the old pan system was fantastic. I mean, my Hebrew is still almost fluent. Um, and then I worked in the Israeli Ministry of Finance, and that was a very bizarre experience for two reasons. The first was because the Israeli economy at the time um, was run by a minister of finance called Yoram Aridor, who practiced what he called proper economics, but what you and I would call 400% inflation. So it was quite disastrous. That was before Israel became startup nation. And the second thing was I had six months work of which six weeks were incredibly busy writing the um, request for US aid. You know, dear Uncle Sam, please send three and a half billion dollars in small unmarked bills, not in serial order. And then I had um, four and a half months doing practically nothing. But I did bone up on the Israeli economy. So that was very interesting. And I enjoyed Israel. Yeah, I still love going there. In 1989, you met your wife, Fiona, uh, and you moved to the UK. That, that must have been quite a change for you, uh, certainly change in, uh, in culture. Uh, how easy was it to find a job at that time? Um, so the change in culture is perhaps less than you think. I think London is the friendliest city in the world towards expats. Um, finding a job was dreadfully difficult. Sweden is a tiny country. I have been politically active. I knew anyone who mattered in Sweden. I could call anyone and they would take my, my calls. 
In Britain, I knew almost nobody. I applied for jobs. I used all my contacts such as they were. I didn't get anything. Uh, I went to talk at one of the think tanks in London. Someone said, you should speak with this guy who's doing the talk. He runs a forecasting consultancy. I applied with him. He interviewed me. Nothing came out of it. A year later, when I was getting a bit desperate, I was still doing consultancy with Swedish clients. I happened to call him again for some other reason. And he said out of the blue, are you still interested in working for us? And I thought, yes. And that's where I spent 20 years after that. So that was great fun. But, but it wasn't, that was, um, it, it, if I were to give the young Gabriel some advice, it would have been uh, prepare the job hunt better when moving. Okay. And a few years after you got married, you, um, you had a daughter, Zoe who's now, I believe, about 20, 27 years old. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, actually, how your family, um, your wife, your daughter, perhaps influenced your taste in music, or maybe you, your taste in music influenced them, or perhaps there's some clashes. I, there have been some clashes. I think, um, so my wife has tried to make me like ballet and that hasn't worked. I've tried. Uh, I have introduced her much more to opera, which I don't think she disliked, but she likes much more. Uh, and perhaps I shouldn't say this given it's a synagogue podcast, but I've also introduced her to Wagner which she now appreciates, although I think she agrees with me that there isn't a single Wagner opera where you couldn't cut an hour in the half in the middle and nobody would notice anything. Um, in terms of lighter music than classical, I think all three of us enjoy completely different things. I do know there was one song where I once impressed my daughter that I knew uh, I knew the song, I liked it, and um, uh, and so on. But apart from that, she doesn't think much of my music taste. And what we will perhaps come to later is there's one genre of music which both of them really, really dislike, and I'm not allowed to play in the car. But well, your second choice um, is the Hebrew song Yalda Shel Ava. I guess uh, it could be translated as um, loving daughter or daughter of love. Uh, Girl of by, is the official title. Yeah, by Sarit Haddad. So how did you come across this particular song and why have you chosen it to take with you on the desert island? I, I just, I think I heard something by Sarit Haddad by, by chance and uh, I like her music. I've got quite a few of her records. This song is upbeat. It is positive, it is joyful, it is fun, and to some extent it reminds me of my daughter. So that would be a good reason to have it along on a, on a desert island. Fantastic. So we're going to play Yalda Shel Ava by Sarit Haddad. הכל תלוי במוח, לא מנסה לזכור מה שאפשר לשכוח, הזמן עובר מהר ואין לאן לברוח, חבל על כל דקה שאני סתם מפסידה. הלכתי אל הרב, אמר מצווה לשמוח, השמש הגדולה נביא את הכוח, גנן אחד נחמד, לימד אותי לפרוח, ישבתי לי לחשוב, מה יעשה לי טוב? הכל באהבה, הכל באושר, הכל תלוי בראש, כבר מהבוקר ילדה של אהבה, עושה שטויות גם בלי מספיק לפרח לך 
recent years, we're going to fast forward a little bit, uh, you've turned to writing historical novels. So what encouraged you to start writing? And from where do you draw your inspiration? Um, so what encouraged me to start writing? I wanted to see if I could do it. And what inspired me was a couple of things. Um, first of all, I'm interested in all types of history, but my specialty is East Roman history of the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and it turns out that following the Norman conquest of, of England in 1066, quite a few Englishmen who didn't want to live under the Norman yoke uh, left the country and eventually ended up in Constantinople, the East Roman capital, and joined a famous unit, which was originally a Swedish and Russian Viking unit, the Barangian Guard. Um, and in 1081, 15 years after Hastings, the Normans from southern Italy uh, invaded the East Roman Empire, and the new emperor marched out against them, and the core of his army was this unit of Englishmen. And here you have the parallels. They're, they're, it's 15 years almost to the day after the Battle of Hastings. And the Normans under their duke have crossed the narrow waters and are invading. This was their chance to get the revenge that they had dreamed of for 15 years. And they messed up and they lost the battle and they were massacred. And so the first idea was the first chapter in this book will be about this battle, but I will not say what battle it is, so that someone who reads it will initially think it's Hastings. And that was the inspiration. And the other thing I should mention is that this emperor who lost that battle, his daughter wrote a biography of him. It's a brilliant book. It's around still. And so I knew there was a source. And so I wrote the first book. It took me uh, it took 10 years to write. For eight years, I had writer's block. Uh, and then I didn't do anything. And then eight years after it was finished, 
I had the offer to self-publish it. And when I did, I realized I had to write more about the hero. So I finished two more books very rapidly within two years and published a trilogy. And I've just finished another book, which would be published before Christmas, by the way, which is also historical, but not a fighting book and not it does not take place in the East Roman Empire. What would you say you, you do to relax or to exercise? Now that, so, now that you're somewhat retired. Yeah, uh, well, my relaxation is uh, reading and listening to music. And I also bicycle a lot. I used to commute by bicycle uh, from about 2000. There was a tube strike and I started biking to work. And then I kept on biking on a daily basis after I stopped uh, going to an office. And uh, it's terribly addictive. I used to bike 20 kilometers a day and think I was very heroic. Uh, and uh, then the pandemic came. And now if I don't bike 60 kilometers in a day, I think I'm slacking and uh, need to do better next day. And, and, and I keep telling myself, don't up this even more. It's getting ridiculous. Besides your close family, I understand you have one other love, which is a love of J.R.R. Tolkien. This is actually quite close to my heart because The Lord of the Rings was my favourite book as a child as well. Oh, really? And, uh, and my son is now slowly being introduced to me. He's recently read The Hobbit and is starting on, on The Lord of the Rings now. Uh, so when did you first read this? And... How much really has this influenced your life? So I first read it. Um, it was recommended to me by my oldest friend. I'm still friendly with him. Uh, let's see, I must have been in year five. So in about 1967, probably. Uh, and I was lucky. It was in the adult part of the library, but I had already checked the books out, so they didn't make me put them back. Um, I thought they were fascinating. How much has it influenced my life? Quite substantially. Uh, it made me read a lot more of other fantasy and some science fiction as well. But above all, I got to know uh, through reading this type of books, I joined organizations for science fiction and fantasy nuts. And uh, I, there are quite a few people that I have met through those that I'm still friendly with. Um, and uh, uh, all people that I've met through friends that I met there. Um, so it was quite... Uh, it certainly has had an enormous impact on my circle of friendship, which in turn, of course, means all my life. Mm. Yes. You're also multilingual. I don't know how many languages you, you are fluent in, but what motivates you to learn all these languages? Um, my family has always been multilingual. My great-great-grandfather, who to confuse things, is also my great so he's my great-grandfather and my great-great-grandfather at the same time. He worked in France for 10 years in the 1870s. And when they came back to Poland, the family continued to speak French at home. And since then, every generation has been raised bilingual. The languages have changed. The principle has remained. Uh, so English is actually my third language. Swedish is my second and French is my first. Uh, I speak five languages reasonably fluently, Swedish, English, French, German, and Hebrew. I speak a bit of Italian, Spanish. I studied Russian and I'm reasonably okay. I picked up a little bit of Polish from my parents because they spoke Polish when they didn't want us to understand what was going on. And I have recently uh, passed an exam in uh, intermediate Chinese. So, and, and I think Yes, English is the world language, but speaking a language, another language gives you a, a really crucial insight into other cultures. And I could not imagine spending time in a country, even a short time, without 
picking up at least a few words. I mean, on that note, you mentioned about the Chinese, the third song is actually a Chinese song. Yes. So Here's some background where you came across this song. And so, uh, you mentioned this a, a little bit, I think you hinted to this a bit earlier, that this is perhaps the genre that your family aren't so keen on. That's right. Um, my wife and daughter think that um, this genre, which is called Mando Pop, in other words, pop in Mandarin, as opposed to Canto pop, which is Cantonese, or K pop and J pop, which are Korean and Japanese, respectively. They think it sounds like Eurovision uh, song, uh, well, Eurovision song contest songs, except it's in Chinese, and they don't like them. So I'm not allowed to play them in the car and so on. I do anyway sometimes. Um, the actor, the singer here, a lady called Wang Fei, um, I was introduced to her by one of my teachers uh, when I was uh, when I started doing Chinese, which I did at SOAS um, almost 20 years ago, uh, was, was my first attempt. Um, and I like her, I like her songs, and I like this particular song, although I should say my Chinese friends always tease me about it and say it's a girly song, but this song, Jimmy Buhui, it means without regret. And I suppose that also fits in with the theme of the first song, uh, Vanity of Vanities. I have, of course there are things I wish I would have done differently in life, but on the whole, no regrets. Yes, 
是属于我的伤悲。我还能用谁的心去体会？真真切切的感受周围，就算疲倦，就算是累，也只能执迷而不悔。算痛苦，就算是累，也是属于我的伤悲。我还能用谁的心去体会？真真切切的感受周围，就算疲倦，就算是累，也只能执迷而不。Finally, I just wanted to ask you, you know, if you're on a desert island, we're not going to see you again now.、Um, if you were to be able to send one sound bite、uh, to the younger generation, to the youth of today, what message would that be? Stand up for what you believe in, but tolerate the views of others.、Uh, that's, I think, that's perhaps even more. Important now than it's been、uh, in、uh, in earlier years of my life. We're seeing a lot of intolerance,、um, and、uh, it's important to combat that. Thank you so much. Thank you for, so much for for coming in and talking to us.、Uh, this has been Rabbi Meir Shindler, and you've been listening to Desert Island Discs.